Should we close the door? Yes, we should. So close it. Okay. For vehicles. Okay, the slate. Angle it a bit towards this. There you go. Okay, and go ahead and mark it. Okay. Give it a second to clear. Thank you, Ambassador Young, for sitting for the interview for us. When is the first time you laid eyes, and under what circumstances, when you first met me, Jackson Jr.? I think. I was aware of Baina Jackson, but we really didn't meet until formally or spend time talking until he decided to run for the Senate after Dr. King's death in 1968. Vince Herman Talmadge. Vince Herman Talmadge. And up until that time, I had not been around. I'd been all over Chicago, Mississippi, Alabama, in and out of Washington. And I'd come to Atlanta just to collapse. Uh, I knew who he was, though, because when I first came to Georgia in 1955, his grandfather, John Wesley Dobbs, asked me if I would run a voter registration drive down in Thomas in Grady County, Georgia. And I had two little churches down there. And um, my grandfather had been active in Masonic orders in Louisiana. And you, you never tell the Grand Master no. <laughs> uh, and he was such an imposing character. Uh, and Maynard was, uh, well, to understand Maynard, you have to understand John Wesley Dobbs. Tell us about John Wesley Dobbs. Uh, because he was one of the original black aristocrats. Uh, he had four or five daughters, I think five daughters. Four of them had PhD degrees, and the fifth one was an opera singer. <laughs> And um, normally in my home, I would have on a T-shirt, be casual like you. But that was not the way it was in the Dobbs home or in my grandfather's home. They always wore shirt and ties. And Maynard came up in that tradition. Um, and it was almost necessary to give yourself enough self-respect and self-esteem at home uh, that the world couldn't take it away. Because once you left home, everybody was trying to put you down, take away your confidence, make you think you were nothing. But um, what I remember about Maynard and John Wesley Dobbs is we might have to recite Bible verses at uh, my dinner table when my grandfather was present. Uh, uh, but at Maynard's, uh, he had to have a, a poem, a Shakespearean sonnet. Uh, and uh, it was the kind of home and the kind of life that let you know you had to be prepared to live in two or three worlds. Uh, you could not let yourself be defined by the white world. Neither could you let yourself be defined by the poor black world that had been beaten down by 400 years of slavery and segregation. And that um, the tradition of John Wesley Dobbs was also the tradition of W.E.B. Du Bois and the Niagara Movement, uh, the emergence of uh, what Du Bois called the Talented Tenth. And that was serious. It was serious that we all had an opportunity to, to get education because our parents and grandparents had gotten an education. 
uh, and that was the key to survival. Uh, and um, I think growing up in that tradition, I say you were trained, you had to live in three worlds. You had to be able to hold your own in the white world. You had to hold your own in your own black bourgeoisie, which in those days was not a bad term. <laughs> uh, and, um, and then you had to be comfortable amongst the poorest of the poor. Because uh, that was that was that was the base that you served. That was your constituency. Mm -hmm. So he had he had big shoes to fill. Then, you know? Oh, he 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 was born uh, to be great, uh, and um, he was taught to be great. And I don't know how many times you would hear to them to whom much has been given of them will much be required. Uh, not suggested. <laughs> you know, it, wasn't, it was a commandment. You've been blessed, so you have to see that the others of the world uh, who have not been as blessed as you get to share some of the opportunities, some of the uh, responsibilities and uh, some of the dignity uh, that the world was trying to take from them. And so we did that uh, through um, uh, Prince Hall Masons, uh, Shriners, Eastern Star, uh, Baptist Church, Congregational Church, Presbyterian Church, Morehouse College, uh, you know, Howard University. Uh, these were institutions that prepared you to lead, but lead from a base. I remember John Wesley Dobbs used to say when he came down to speak at the voter registration drive, uh, which really caused a Klan rally uh, to try to intimidate us, and we we sort of worked that out. Um, and we worked it out by going to the mayor. And the mayor got on the phone with the uh, two largest employers, still there, Sunnyland Packing Company and Flowers Bakery. And they agreed, we agreed with them uh, that uh, the Klan had the right to march. Uh, but. Uh, the Klan did not have the right to march through the black community to intimidate our citizens. Uh, and uh, that was possible in 1955 in part because I think it was 1948 that the Prince Hall Masons with Thurgood Marshall had um, challenged the Democratic white primary. And in the case, um, can't remember it now, but it was a AME preacher from Columbus, um, Primus King case. Um, that's what got us the right to vote in the Democratic primary. Uh, but we were mostly still then uh, black folk or Republicans. And uh, Grandmaster Dobbs told me, in addition to uh, voting for, I mean, to registering voters, he said we wanted to get the voters, black voters, to vote for Eisenhower. And I said, but I was, uh, I, I was supporting Adley Stevenson. Uh, Adlai Stevenson. He said that was when you were up north in school. He said, if the Adlai Stevenson wins, Richard Russell uh, and Senator George will nominate the judges. If Eisenhower wins, we're the only black Republicans, and we get to nominate the federal judges from the South. 
that's a key issue that made possible everything that we did. And that's the reason I take the time to do it. That decision made Maynard, it made Martin, it made me, it made everybody in the South because the black Republicans nominated all of the federal judges that decided our cases. Every last one of them was an Eisenhower appointee. The F Supreme Court, which gave us the Supreme Court decision of 1954, well, almost all Eisenhower appointees, see? And so it, um, it was a very practical kind of politics. And uh, I think the thing I remember most about John Wesley Dobbs' speech, and that was 60 years ago, stick with this blue-eyed boy, but watch him. <laughs> and he was, he, he was not for separation. He was, this was the time of Marcus Garvey. He was not in any way a separatist. This is our land, see, and we are responsible uh, to help run it. Uh, and um, we can't run it alone, but we are the ta a talented tenth, which are to help those who are less fortunate. But we're also I don't know what term to use um, a black elite that has a different view of the world than the white elite. And, well, the way my father put it to me was, white supremacy is a sickness, and you don't ever get mad with sick people. Uh, but you have to know that it's a sickness that says one people or race is superior to another. That sickness comes out of fear and insecurity, which leads to hatred and violence. And you don't get caught up in that. Uh, you don't get mad, you get smart. See, your mind is the most powerful weapon you have. Uh, and when you get angry, you cut off the blood flow from your mind. Uh, and, you, and you stop thinking and you do stupid things, like run or fight. And so it was, I would say that was probably the basis of where our nonviolence came from. It was, you know you outnumbered 10 to one. You know you have no weapons. You know you uh, are always on the edge and always vulnerable. So you have to always stay alert and think one step ahead. But because you're in touch with the masses of people who are suffering, you have different insights and better insights into the problems of the society than the rich who don't have to deal with the problems. We were a fortunate middle ground. We could relate both ways. And Maynard understood that. Maynard was raised to live that way. And, and Maynard jumped into politics, not necessarily thinking that he could win, but thinking that it was important for somebody to be out sounding the alarm after Dr. King's death, somebody rallying uh, the people of the state of Georgia and of the Southern nation. So he lost to Thomas, but then he became the vice mayor under Sam Marcel. And then when he made the decision. He didn't become. Oh, that is the way. No, he, he, actually I think he told me that, um, well see, at that time Atlanta was 
still struggling between blacks and whites. They did not have a majority of reasonable, sensible, progressive white folk. And in fact, just before that, Mayor Hartsfield had lost the election because he bought the airport, he brought Delta here, he put up red lights, uh, and he got voted out of office. And the business establishment, which was mostly led by Coca-Cola, uh, decided that there were there were not enough progressive white people to move this city forward as fast as it needed to move. Uh, and so they went to Dr. Mays and Daddy King and uh, John Wesley Dobbs, and, and, and they formed a coalition, a coalition of conscience is what Martin Luther King used to call it. But it was basically a pragmatic coming together of the black intelligentsia and the white rich. Uh, but it was really the most progressive people of both. But we could bring along the masses of people with us uh, because all of the preachers and all of the teachers and all of the, the uh, Masonic leaders were all a part of an organized movement that could get out the vote and deliver the vote. And that's what transformed, that's what transformed Atlanta. It's closed now. Okay, so. let's, let's, you can sit, you can sit. So, that was, so if you remember, what was, I mean, man, it was vice mayor, I'm just, you know, in that Sam Cell administration. What were their, their roles? It seems to be a lot of tension between those two. Well, I think there was a lot of tension. Um, because I think Sam knew that Maynard was on his heels from the very beginning. And um, I say that you can look at Atlanta in terms of black and white, and that's one way to look at it. You can also look at the politics of Atlanta from the 1940s to the present. And in almost every race, we voted not just on race, but we also voted for the smartest and most dedicated person who was running. And that was true with Ivan Allen and uh, Muggsy Smith, I think, was his opponent. Uh, but um, Coca-Cola and J. Paul Austin, when Maine had decided to run for mayor, all the business community together and said, look, if any of our sons were this intelligent, were this indedic dedicated, and were this determined to help make this a great city, we wouldn't hesitate to support them. He said, we've got to put aside our prejudices. Now, Paul Austin had been in South Africa um, running Coca-Cola, so he had seen what racism and apartheid could do to society. And so he not only stood up for Maynard in the 1970s, but he had threatened to move Coca-Cola out of Atlanta when they talked about boycotting a dinner honoring Martin Luther King in 1964. Uh, and and he was from LaGrange, Georgia. I mean, he was not a, he was not what you'd call a liberal, but I, I don't know, he was an enlightened businessman that understood that his product had to survive in a global economy that was made up mostly of colored peoples and that it, you couldn't survive in business in the world if you were identified with white supremacy or racism. What was the, 
was your reaction when you made this decision to run for mayor? What was your opinion? Well, I thought it was crazy. Um, because I never, I don't like to play politics. And I think I understood why he was doing it. He was doing it because he had to do something. He couldn't just let, and I think that's part of, uh, that's part of, of the nonviolent message. When, when somebody is struck down doing the right thing for the right reasons for the nation and the people, 10 people have to take his place. Otherwise, you let them think that death is a way to stop the movement. Now, the way Dr. King used to put it, and he probably got it from Dr. Mays, which is probably where Mann had got it, same sort of idea, that to be free, you've got to overcome the love of wealth and the fear of death. And it was defying death to say that you were going to go around Georgia campaigning against the leading segregationist, uh, one of the leading segregationists in the South. But they developed a, an uncanny respect for each other as a result of that. And I remember going with Maynard to see Talmadge later on when he was mayor and we wanted to move the airport. We wanted to keep the airport down south. And the majority of the white community wanted to move the air, build a new airport up north. Uh, we had to move an expressway. And uh, Maynard came to me and the Secretary of Transportation was uh, Bill Coleman who had been the president, chairman of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund uh, and a uh, very prominent lawyer. Uh, I think supposedly the first black person to make Harvard Law Review, uh, like Barack Obama was you know, one of the few that ever did that. and, and uh, but Bill Coleman said, look, it's reasonable to keep the airport in the South, but I can't tear up an uh, interstate highway to place an airport in its place. He said, the co Congress and the Senate would tear me to pieces uh, over this. And we said, no. Um, Senator Talmadge lives down that way, and he's the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. So I think it costs around a hundred million dollars to tear up that road and move it somewhere. And Bill Coleman said that the Senate would never agree to that. So Maynard and Bill Coleman and uh, Weich Fowler, who was then Maynard's vice mayor, and I went to see Talmadge. And uh, Talmadge uh, was very responsive because that new highway was running through his property. <laughs> uh, and um, in those days, he could, uh, he could do things with a pencil in the federal budget and nobody would question it. And we, we did that with him on that occasion. We did it again uh, with Talmadge on creating Wiles Medical School. So um, Maynard's running against Talmadge, I think helped soften him up and helped him to realize that uh, the racism his father had passed and he had to work with uh, black leadership uh, to get what he wanted even. Uh, and so it turned out in the long run to have been uh, a very successful challenge. Because even though he, he didn't win the seat, 
He won respect to people all over the state. Uh, he established a progressive agenda that had never been heard, and he did something that I don't know any other politician has done. I, he raised money. I think there were 18 counties in Georgia where there was a black majority, and uh, they had no elected officials. and were not even registered to vote. So he raised $1,000 a county. That was a lot of money back then for them to run voter registration drives. Uh, and because um, he understood that Atlanta could not survive as an island of prosperity in the midst of Georgia, that uh, we had to reach out and uh, work with the whole state. Of course, that was his grandfather's legacy, too. Many people look at Mayor Jackson being at the forefront of affirmative action, you know, during his tenure as mayor. How would you describe how progressive he was working within the corridors of power? Well, I think that Mayor Jackson was uh, unique in his understanding of affirmative action. There were others that went before him. Uh, Nixon, uh, even Sam Massell had agreed to 20% uh, of set aside for minorities. Uh, but what usually happened was that black folk got 20% of the work, but it was usually the hardest work with the lowest profit margin. And Maynard's unique contribution, which exists in Atlanta and not, I don't know whether it exists any place else in the nation or the world, uh, that every single contract had to be a joint venture between minority and majority contractors and that minority included women, because there were not, there was not a single white woman owner of a business who had a city contract. Uh, and so um, he opened the doors to uh, everybody. Uh, and um, it was the best thing that could have happened for the city. It's the key to our growth and development but people hated him for it. Really? I mean, they literally hated him for it. And, um, and, and when he left office, nobody offered him a job in Atlanta. Uh, and I think it caused his death because it meant that he had to go all the way to Chicago. He had to commute back and forth to Chicago uh, to be responsible for feeding his family. So are you saying the, the white power structure hated him, the corporate entities hated him? They, they, they resented the fact that he forced them to do something that they didn't believe in. Now, when I came along, it had worked because everything that he did happened to come out on time and under budget. <laughs> so it was, it established the credibility of efficiency and honesty and integrity in Atlanta that was good for everybody's business, see? And um, so he would not build the airport unless 25% of each and every contract. That means every legal contract, that means every real estate contract, uh, every bond, we would not buy bonds from uh, Wall Street if they did not have black uh, executives in, de in decision-making positions that could do business with us. And so he played them against each other. And when I came in, I it was already established. I just had to ease it up a little bit. So we eased it up to 35 percent. 
And then with the Olympics, we got it up to 41%. But I had to explain that this was the reason Atlanta was growing. See, they didn't give Maynard a chance to explain. And they couldn't see it then. But after eight years, and I was also not doing just city projects. I had brought in international money. And I said, look, you know, if, if we, well, with the Olympics, which we both worked on, I said, if, if we have 40% of a billion dollars, uh, that looks like a lot of money if that's all you're looking at. But I said, if we get the Olympics here, um, and minorities get 40% of the work, there's gonna be another 10, $15 billion coming in here that you will get 90% of and minorities will be lucky to get 10% of. I said, now if we get to fighting over 40% of $1 billion, you're gonna lose 90% of 10, $15 billion. Well, that made sense. <laughs> and it exact, it happened. The day we were, were in Tokyo and it was announced, uh, UPS decided to move here. Um, ING, which is now Voya, moved here. And what is now the uh, Four Seasons was built by a Greek Olympia chain. So those three main businesses moved in the very day we won the Olympics. And we've had a steady stream of business coming in here uh, that comes in here because we all share in the wealth. Uh, and we, under Maynard, we started maybe with 20% of the hardest work, but he opened the door to every department, legal, accounting, investing, uh, only thing we didn't get into, and still haven't, is uh, streets and highways. We don't have road builders. We have airport builders. But no road builders. No road builders. I don't think, even to this day. So in his first two terms as mayor, did you think that there were, you know, all, with all the positive positives that made it, were there any missteps, any flaws in his personality that you think had an impact on him as the mayor of the city? No, I, I, I think that um, Maynard broke every stereotype. And um, the only thing that people could fault him for <laughs> was being too articulate, too smart too progressive, you know. And it's very hard for people who have been in charge all their lives to admit that somebody else has a better idea. And they can't believe that this could happen. And with me, it was not, I said, there was no more money in Washington. After Maine had left, Reagan became the president and cut off almost all the money that was available for the cities. But Maine had established a precedent that I didn't understand. And that was, he didn't go to Washington only, he went to Wall Street. And so all of the money from the airport came from Wall Street and he had structured the deal so that we could borrow money. We had a triple A bond rating and we could borrow money and um, before anybody could make money, they had to put money in a sinking fund to take care of the debt. So we always had money to pay the bills because while we were building things, people were putting money aside so that if something happened, if there was a stumbling block, the debt could be paid and we'd keep our bond rating. Smart. And I think that 
I remember he spent, he, he went to Wall Street and came back with $478 million just from signing his name. But he signed his name on the bottom. On the top was Delta, Eastern, American, uh, Hertz, Avis, uh, Dobbs House, uh, all of the other concessionaires. Everybody that was going to make money in the airport had to sign on the dotted line, and the city was last. And so everybody else had to go broke before the city had to pay. <laughs> and but it also meant that everybody had to be paid, paid the debt service had to be paid before anybody could make any money. And I don't, I've been unable to find out how much money we've put into that airport. <coughs> I know he put at least a billion dollars in it. I can remember maybe three or four hundred million, um, well, the first, the T concourse had not been built, so I, I was trying to do that as an international concourse. And but we also built two more runways, so I, I don't know. Uh, but the nearest guess I can make is that we probably spent close to ten, fifteen billion dollars that we've gotten in Wall Street bonds. But last year alone, that airport generated $38 billion in one year and was responsible for 400,000 jobs. See? And that's been every year since Maynard. Uh, it's been running every year since we built it. It's been doubling its investment, uh, both in jobs and in the spin-off contracts that have come as a result of having built it that way. And I don't think, you know, other cities don't do their work that way. They still depend on taxpayers. And so Maynard taught us, taught us to use not only Washington, which he used very well, but he knew that there was more money on Wall Street than there was on Wash in Washington. Smart business. Smart business. It was absolutely brilliant. And I still don't think that there are many cities that understand that. That's kind of weird. Just cheering about mm -hmm. no, keep going. Keep rolling. Keep rolling. rolling. So when did people start to watch you? Hmm? When did folks start to approach you, including Maynard, about you running for mayor? What was your reaction? Well, I, uh... You need to take a sip of water, Ambassador. I'm, I'm, I'm just my sinuses. Uh, but uh, I came back from the United Nations rather suddenly <laughs> and unexpectedly. And only to discover that the white community had put up two $2 million for anybody white to run for mayor. <laughs> and there, there was a consensus in the business community that because Cleveland and Newark and Chicago, I mean, and Detroit, uh, were having trouble that they just they decided that business would not come to cities with black mayors and um, we were in danger of rolling back the clock on everything that Maynard had done now my problem was that I'd been in the civil rights movement where Dr. King figured if you have were helping the poor, you had to be poor. <laughs> and um, Congress and the UN, and I mean, I was broke. And I had three kids, one in law school, one in engineering school, one ready to go to college, and one more 
and the wings. And the mayor's salary was $50,000 a year. And um, I didn't see how I could live on that. So Maine had asked me to come to a meeting to discuss who we should get behind. And I, I don't know whether he set me up on this or not, but I was sitting in the meeting, um, just a sort of group of people sitting in a circle, and uh, this lady came in on her cane. She was about 80. And she came and she walked right up to me and she said, shook a stick in my face. She said, look here, boy. When you came here, you wasn't nothing. <laughs> said, we made you somebody. We, I said, well, Martin Luther King made me. She said, we made him too. And we done sent you all over the world to Congress and the United Nations. And now we need you back here. And you ain't got time for us. We done wasted our time on you. And she turned and she walked out of the room. <laughs> And then everybody sat there and looked at me, you know, and how are you going to say no to that? So, but I had no, I, I had no desire to be mayor. I was through with politics. I didn't know what else I wanted to do. Um, but I also didn't see anybody else that could get, I mean, when I ran for Congress, Maynard and I's running had been pretty much back to back. He got started in 68 and I ran in 70 and lost. He ran in 68 and lost. Um, I ran in 72 and won. And he ran in 73 and won. But we were basically registering the same voters, organizing the same people, and, and learning how to get out the vote. Um, so that... Um, Well, I remember in, in my first race, the race that I won, it was a pouring down rain, but we had a 74% black turnout in the rain, rained all day long, and we still got about 14% of the white vote. Um, and we had to, so the next year, Maynard's running for mayor. Uh, and so a lot of the, the same people, the same organization, and there's no question that he was very helpful in getting me into Congress. Um, and he taught me, Maynard had been an encyclopedia salesman. And he knew how to sell things and he wasn't, he wasn't ashamed to ask for money. <laughs> and uh, he saw whether it was encyclopedias or a running for mayor, it was doing you a favor. It was helping you. Uh, so he wasn't begging. He was just saying, this is in your interest uh, that you get these encyclopedias and understand anything you want to know, you can look up. And uh, I was for Google. <laughs> and, uh, but it made him it, it made him a good salesman for ideas uh, as well as products. Uh, but that was resented, you know, uh, and uh, when I came back, uh, I really didn't, uh, have any plans, uh, but I think Jesse Jackson was graduating, and uh, I went up to speak for his graduation at University of Chicago, and I went in the bookstore, and right staring me in the face was a book, Cities and the Wealth of Nations by Jane Jacobs. And I started reading about, and, and what, what it said basically was uh, that nations, that countries don't create wealth. Cities create wealth. 
people have problems in communities and they pool their resources and they figure out how to solve those problems. And that's how new companies start. That very seldom do companies start at the federal level so, or the state level. They usually at the point where there's a problem that forces people to get together, put their money together to solve it. And that made sense. And it also made sense that, uh, as the lady said, I'd been all over the world, so there was a lot of money in the world that was not being used because they didn't know what to do with it. They were putting their petrodollars into Swiss banks, into German banks, into Dutch banks, into Japanese banks, and and they were pay paying, in, they were charging them to keep the money. And so when Maynard kind of got me uh, set up that way, and I started running and reading at the same time, I, I began to see that we could continue doing what he had done uh, and that Wall Street didn't have any national boundaries. <laughs> that Wall Street money could come through Germany, it could come through uh, Holland, uh, and come through Japan, Canada, England. Uh, and so we started bringing the money in, uh, international money in, as he had brought. Well, because once it gets to Wall Street, you don't know what. I mean, it's all green <laughs> when it gets to you. So, you're the mayor of Atlanta. Maine has been the mayor of Atlanta. What's the, what's the, I mean, what's the personal sacrifices one makes as a mayor in a big city like this? Well, one, you never think you're sacrificing uh, because you're serving. And the rewards are everything but financial. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and you you and your family make tremendous sacrifices uh, the way my son put it that you gave us the worst of both worlds you gave us fame with no fortune <laughs> everybody thinks we're important but we're really broke you see and uh, that uh, because one of the things that was necessary from the civil rights movement and, and in politics is that, that everybody could make money but your family. Uh, and uh, it was very difficult uh, for, for any of us to survive, even though none of the business that we brought in here was city money. Uh, and uh, nothing at the airport is built with taxpayer dollars. It's all international money. Uh, and uh, it's there not because of anything the taxpayers have done except vote to be the guarantor of last resort. If everybody else goes bankrupt, then the city becomes involved. But as long as the thing is working, and that, that airport has been generating wealth for the entire region uh, now since 1981 when he opened it. But it was the blessing for me because the airport, I got elected in November 81, the airport opened December 1st, 1981. So I had, I mean, I had everything set up for me. And, and I, I, I always give Maynard credit uh, for doing all of the hard, dirty work that made it possible for me to be as successful as I was. I mean, he took on the fight to get rid of the police chief, see, the racist police chief. So. All I had to do was come in behind him and integrate it down low. And, and um, we ended up 
he had replaced the white racist chief with two black PhDs. Uh, and um, we started the concept of community policing and we started integrating the police. But then we had the missing and murdered children toward the end of his term. And uh, we had to do things with, uh, uh, I mean, th these murders were not in the city of Atlanta. They involved city of Atlanta children quite often, but the bodies were being found all over the region. And so we had to learn to work with the surrounding district to solve this problem. And, and everybody thought that this was some kind of racist clan uh, sort of thing. Uh, and all of us, Maynard, me, police chief, uh, public safety commissioner, all of us had children in that age group. See, that's been terrifying. Uh, well, we were, but they weren't. You know, and um, so that, that it was, it was a, a, a dangerous time, but it, it forced us to work together with the surrounding counties. And um, so when our police commissioner left and went to New York, Lee Brown, uh, the police chief that had worked with us on the missing and murdered children, the major, uh, who was white, uh, I Sounds like my wife's phone. She's not here. Yeah. Whose phone is that? Whose phone? It's probably my wife's. But just cut it off. She she forgot it. So when the new police chief. So when the the new police chief happened to be, you know, white, and so we then began. We had, but he was also a local boy. Who actually had worked on Auburn Avenue during the Civil Rights Movement, and uh, had, and really knew more about about Atlanta than the people we were bringing in, um, and um, and so we ended up with a police force that was about half and half black and white but significantly was 30% female. And I think that we both realized uh, that the most available talent pool that was underemployed at that time was not only black men, but black and white women. And so, he, uh, in his appointments of judges and uh, appointments of commissioners, uh, we desegregated the administration, not only racially, but gender-wise. So he had had some issues with one of his refugees, which was just before you came, became mayor. You mm -hmm. those incidents, that, that issue? Um, well, I think that what has happened to us is that uh, we were having such phenomenal success that um, nobody wanted to believe it. And so they kept, they kept trying to get something on us. And they sent a number of people I remember one person that was indicted said that uh, all they were asking him was, uh, give us something on Maynard and you can go free. And there was nothing he could give on Maynard. Uh, and so that's the cr cruelest prejudice. See, people are prejudiced against politicians, first of all. 
they think all politicians are dishonest. That's correct. Right. They think all black people are dishonest. So they, when you see a black politician, they don't even question whether or not he's honest. They just want to know how he's being crooked. And so all of our lives have been transparent and taken apart. Uh, we've been harassed. Our friends have been indicted uh, and um, persecuted. Uh, and when, I mean, I moved here in 1966, and we put that gate up a couple of years ago, uh, and we had to have a security system. Uh, we found a wire running into my house. Uh, I said, technician said, how many, what lines you say you have? I said, we only have four lines. He said, oh no. There are five lines running into your house. So I said, well, see where it's coming from. And he traced it to about three or four blocks down the street where uh, I don't remember who was living there in the 60s. Uh, but I was living here. For Shirley Franklin was living two blocks over. Uh, Maynard, about six or eight blocks. You could almost bug the whole neighborhood. Uh, from here, uh, uh, and uh, so I, I'm sure that whether it, it came from my days in the Civil Rights Movement or whether it was, uh, uh, you know, from my time in Congress or mayor, uh, Almost everything we've done has been investigated, monitored, and, and uh, uh, if they found anything, uh, they would have used it to try to destroy us. What was, it, what was your opinion about Maynard deciding he wanted to be mayor again after your tenure? Well, I welcomed the fact that he wanted to be mayor because I didn't know, well, one, there was a practical reason. You have to be in government 14 years to get a pension. So I think he'd been in government 12 years. Uh, so two more years would entitle him to a pension. And by that time, the mayor's salary was significantly better. In fact, I thought I raised the mayor's salary when I was going out up to 200000 which I thought was a reasonable salary for a city this size. And you're handling some $3 billion uh, worth. I mean, this, this is the largest corporation. City was the largest corporation um, in the state. Uh, and every CEO of a corporation this size was getting paid in the millions. So 200000 was not bad for a city mayor. Uh, and it would have given him a chance to get a pension, uh, which I thought he was entitled to. Uh, but I also thought that he had the experience to uh, continue the work we were doing, bringing in the Olympics, and. Um, following up on uh, on all of those things that we finally had evolved into so it was it was it was good but 1990 this the urban cities are going through lots of different issues there's homelessness there's economic issues you know what did he what did he come into I mean, the cities were changing the well the cities had changed largely because I mean, we never had homelessness until 1982. And if you look, that's when Reagan started cutting out the veterans' hospitals uh, and saying that they would treat veterans on out, outpatient basis. And so over half of the people in our streets who were homeless were veterans, who should have been in a veterans' hospital. Uh, and as they began to cut back on, on government support 
uh, for families and companies and the like, uh, we ended up we ended up with more and more homelessness, um, and yet we were able, largely through our churches, and um, I mean our policemen were instructed to pick up people. Uh, and take them to jail and feed them and give them a place to stay. Uh, and uh, we worked with a number of social agencies to try to deal with this problem. But like San Francisco, the more you do, the more people you draw. And we were growing, and we were the money center of the South. So that's why people came here. They came here looking for jobs. And, but everybody came. And, um, and we had such a good university system that we were bringing in people who already were qualified for jobs and trained for jobs so that the people came in looking uh, you know, for untrained employment were always uh, always left. And we, we had a, a manpower center that they could report to. And uh, we did everything we could to find employment and housing. Uh, we had a Homestead Act where we got the FHA to uh, let us take over homes that were vacant, and you could buy them for a dollar. And I think it was something that I had supported and introduced when I was in Congress, and Maynard had implemented it here, uh, where uh, you can pick a, a house out of the fishbowl and for a dollar, but you had to sign to live in it for five years and repair and restore it, and we gave you a low interest loan of at least of at least five thousand uh, dollars to fix it up. Uh, and we got a lot of people as homeowners and restored a lot of homes uh, with programs like that. But still, when I was running for Congress. We had a million people here. Now we have six and a half million. And so is we're growing faster and the problems are continuing to grow and we're continuing to struggle with them. But um, it's hard to have the vision and insight to make all of the infrastructure improvements. Uh, we both had a very hard time uh, building roads. Uh, and, uh, but if we hadn't built them, uh, people did not want the mass transit system. Uh, they didn't want to support it. So, uh, the hospital downtown, Grady Hospital, every major city has a great hospital. Uh, and our, our hospital had been allowed to run down. Uh, so we had, had constant work to do. Uh, and one, the Olympics helped us quite a bit, too, uh, because um, Maynard was mayor during the bid process. So that, um, and I was chairman of the Olympic Committee after I left the mayor's office. And so we worked together to try to use the Olympic funds to help solve some of the problems. So why do you, s Wait, you cut? Three minutes left on this. Did you get Let's that? change. We're going to cut. OK. Cut. Hey, Alex? This is a few more questions. Mm -hmm. Cut. See. But in the process, they drove the business out. And we hooked up with the business community because the labor unions were racist back then. And we brought the labor unions in. But uh, we didn't, uh, 
We didn't drive business out. We brought more business in. Oh, I didn't realize you didn't think about it that way. I hadn't either till it was a guy that uh, was in the White House with Obama, and uh, but this there are many things that are unique about Atlanta that uh, when Harold Washington was thinking about running for mayor, all of us went up there uh, and campaigned with him and uh, showed him how to put the airport together <laughs> uh, like we put ours together. So, and um, it problem is it, it, I mean, this was a long time evolving. And we had, we've been very fortunate. I, I worry now uh, because people don't appreciate how they got here, uh, how they got into the positions they're in. And um, the one thing we did, we never had a public fight. Man and I didn't disagree on anything. And the only thing that I disagreed with John Lewis and Bill Campbell about was they had taken a no roads pledge. Um, and they didn't want Georgia 400, and they didn't want the Presidential Parkway, Centennial Parkway. And, uh, but that never became, uh, it never became public, and it never became unfriendly. Uh, and uh, that's not true anymore. Everything is public. Mm -hmm. When Mank decided not to, to seek re-election in 1993, what, what was his rationale? What did you think? Why, why did he decide that he didn't want to try for another term as mayor? I don't know, but I think that uh, this is a very demanding job. And uh, it's literally 20 hours a day. Uh, because you cannot go to the grocery store, you can't go to church, uh, you can't do anything. Um, you know, without uh, somebody coming, bringing you another problem. And I don't know that uh, Well, I don't know whether he knew some things about his health that were not public. But it is a physical and emotional strain. And I think things were going very well, and things were going very well when he left the first time. And I think that he felt that uh, maybe now was the time to get out and do as a private citizen. I had also found that um, I enjoyed life and did just as much for the community when I was no longer mayor. Um, and uh, I was, I mean, people still come to me with all kinds of problems and, and they say, uh, I supported you when you were mayor, and I never asked you for a single favor, but I need <coughs> now, <laughs> 30 years later. Golly, it's almost 40 years since I was mayor. Mm -hmm. But since I was in Congress. Mm -hmm. But you, you're never done. Mm -hmm. Where were you with the day that the mayor, the mayor passed away? I don't know where I was, but I know that I have caught that plane 
he was going to Washington to a meeting. And it's expensive to stay in Washington hotels. And every night you can spend with your family is a good night. So the tendency is for us to stay at home and get up and get the early bird flight, 6 o'clock. Well, a few weeks, months afterwards, I uh, had a similar experience where you get there at 5 o'clock, 4.30, quarter to 5, means you didn't sleep much at night. Uh, it's a long walk from there, and the uh, the trains and the carts that haul you in, that plane leaves from gate T1. And I caught it one morning, and when I got to the, by the time I walked the mile or so from the parking lot, and another mile almost to the to the gate, I was wringing wet. I was sweating like I don't know what. And I immediately drank two or three bottles of water and went to sleep. Um, I was awakened by a lady who was standing over me and who just fell in my lap. And um, she obviously had had the same experience at that gate and didn't drink water. And fortunately, there were some doctors there on the plane that they laid her down on the floor and resuscitated her. But flying in the early morning is a real strain. And that plane goes in at gate 15 in Washington National, Reagan Airport. And Maynard got off the plane and just dropped at the gate. And um, a friend of his who was going to the same meeting was coming in from the New York shuttle. And he said he saw them gather around, but he was late for the meeting, so he rushed on by. And I always remember that, that when you give it all you got and when you're done, most of the time, even your best friends will just walk on by. <laughs> and when you commit yourself to public life, you really do commit your life. And you commit your family. Uh, and um, it's, it's in many ways a thankless task. Um, and um, it takes it takes a lot to survive. I I, I consider myself very fortunate that uh, that I was able to make it through that. Um, and uh, but in the long run, it's worth it if people learn the lessons. Um, I learned a lot of lessons from Maynard. Um, lessons that were hard for me. What were some of them? Well, I remember he told me that um, I needed to pay personal calls on as many of the business community as I could. He said, it's easier to do your job if they know you personally and they have a chance to speak to you one-on-one -on -one. and you have a relationship. And he says it's time consuming, uh, but it's important uh, that you have the support 
of the business community. Um, one of the lessons I tried to teach him was that uh, I had learned from Ivan Allen that you also have to have the support of the press. And I made it a point to go see the newspaper at least once a month. And the television stations maybe once a quarter. Just drop in and have a cup of coffee and let them know what's on your mind and let them understand what you're thinking. Because they've got to do a story every day. And if they don't know what's going on, they'll make something up. Or they'll twist it wrong. And they'll always attribute the worst possible motives to anything you do. So you, you kind of have to go and be transparent with why is it you want to do this? See, what's in it for you? And what's in it for the city? And most of the stuff that we talk about, there isn't anything in it for us. Uh, but, um, you know, hard work. Uh, and uh, like old man River, body all aching and brack with pain. <laughs> Tote that barge, lift that bail, get a little drunk and you land in jail. No sympathy, no support. Uh, even from your friends. And uh, so whenever somebody says to me they want to be a mayor, I say, why? You know, <laughs> what in the hell for? <laughs> and I, I want, well, I'm telling you, you're, you're setting yourself up for public abuse, constant scrutiny, uh, criticism by everybody. Uh, and, um, well, I don't know. I, I, I went to see uh, a group of uh, business people uh, when I was finally decided that I was had to run. And they said, well, what can you do? What are you going to do as mayor? I said, well, there's no more money in Washington, and I have to figure out how to get some we have to become the next great international city. And one of the guys said to the businessman that brought me there, where in the hell did you get this nut? <laughs> and um, I took him with me uh, to Germany. Um, and we saw how we had set up meetings with German business and how we got Lufthansa flying in here. They didn't want to fly in here at first, and we said, no, you know, if you're going to be in the American marketplace in the 21st century, the best place is Atlanta. And Maine had built that airport. I, I said, it can get you anywhere in America, 80% of the U.S. market, you can reach in two hours. And this is the best place to put a business. Well, we got a couple of German businesses on that trip, but now we have almost 2,000 German businesses around Atlanta. Uh, there are only 3,000 in the entire United States, but they're all around here, and they're basically because of that airport. Uh, there, there were 1,500 before Porsche and uh, Mercedes decided to move their headquarters here. Uh, so we're still profiting by the legacy of Maynard Jackson. That is everybody but Maynard's family <laughs> and the people who really did the work and had the vision. Um, and the uh, only thing I can say about being mayor is... Uh, Great is your award in heaven, because you sure will catch hell on earth. <laughs> so if you, if you could just sum up, what is, what is, what is the legacy of Maynard Jackson to the city of Atlanta? The legacy of Maynard Jackson to the city of Atlanta is that he forced us to live together as brothers, or we could have perished together as fools. But 
integrating the economy was far more significant and far more important than simply integrating the society, uh, the restaurants. and you, The economic integration is the legacy of Maina Jackson. And um, that feeds into good schools. It feeds into good recreation. It feeds into uh, first-rate sports teams. Uh, it feeds into the growth and development of creative business, but Maynard also always had a nonprofit arm where he had Maynard Jackson scholars and where he uh, identified young people and gave them a sense of the duty of public life. Uh, and his foundation is doing that to this day. Uh, but um, someone asked me, why is it that Detroit was six million in the 1970s and Atlanta was one million? Now Atlanta is six and a half million and Detroit is one and a half million. And I think the difference is that Maynard created a coalition with the business community. And the business community needed it as much as we did. But we've, uh, we've made it work up to now. And it's been fair, everybody has benefited because we work together. I don't think Maynard and I ever had an argument about anything. We might have had an intellectual disagreement, but when I heard his side, I realized what it was, the, the importance of what he had to say, and when he heard my reservations of my side, he had respect for whatever it was that I thought. And, um, we basically worked together on everything. And um, I probably would not have run for Congress even if he had not run for the Senate. And I sure wouldn't have run for mayor if he hadn't gotten me in the corner with Miss Susie Laborde. <laughs> uh, but I'm grateful. Uh, and uh, it's the best job I ever had. And it's been more rewarding to me than it has been tr trouble. Uh, but uh, it's the kind of thing that you can't do it just because you're ambitious. Uh, it has to kind of be a calling. And I always said that Maynard really was called to be a preacher. His daddy was a preacher. His grandfather was uh, an eloquent orator, as was Maynard. Uh, and in many ways, he was a preacher. But he had a two million member church, which was the city of Atlanta, not a single little church building. In fact, Maynard, if he had become chairman of the Democratic Party, when he offered himself in service there, the whole nation might have been different. Um, but uh, it didn't happen. And I think that, uh, well, I think that whatever we let him do and whatever we helped him to do, he more than rewarded us with uh, success, uh, favor, honesty, integrity, uh, and a sense of uh, due diligence. You know, I, I, I have a way of kind of being, you know, part of a dream.
uh, he worked out details. And, um, and I think that uh, was a very good manager of urban affairs. And there ought to be a course at Morehouse. I was sorry that there was not a building named after him. I think we have named, or in the process of naming, the street running through Morehouse campus. Because the lessons he taught and the truths that he demonstrated here in Atlanta are absolutely necessary for all cities. This whole Black Lives Matter movement now oh, couldn't happen in Atlanta because we got half and half black and white police. And we practice community policing. Our police have to sit down with, and that's Maynard's legacy, have to sit down with the community and let the community tell them how they need to be served and how they want to be protected. But um, in most cities in the world, the police become an occupying army that are anti-citizenry. And democracy can't work that way. I mean, it's to build those shoes, those shoes he had to build. He did. Mm -hmm. That's cut. I think we have it. <coughs> you need room tone? Room tone? I'm going to leave the cameras rolling. I'm going to leave the cameras rolling. And this will be room tone for the Andrew Young interview. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.